must cause confusion and delay. You have caused confusion and delay. No, I think you were face prejudice. <laughs> Stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. Bit grey today. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another uh, deepest law. Um, I still think that intro is too jolly. It's too kind of it sounds too much like a good time. Uh, too much banter and so on. Uh, but anyway, welcome. We're going to be continuing with the Adam Curtis uh, review series. Um, the series, uh, as, I, as I've said, if it gets more than 7.7 thousand views, which is what the first episode uh, got. Well, in fact, the first episode is up to 8.9 now, but 7.7 .7 is the magic figure. If it gets more than that, I will continue doing them. If it ever gets less than that, the series will stop, okay? <laughs> um, we are on episodes five and six, and we're going to be watching uh, those soon. Just being a little bit, sorry I'm a little bit late, I was distracted by d truly, truly stupid uh, takes on Twitter, like marrying Taylor Swift is gay. Um, like, seriously, people have to stop this mindset of calling getting married even if even if it's at the age of 34 it's just stop calling straight relationships uh, or marriage to a woman gay we already have uh, a massive um problem where people are not reproducing okay so the least of anybody's concern is the idea that taylor swift is in a straight relationship fucking retards uh anyway uh this is not about that but i had to get it off my chest because i see more and more of this kind of utterly lame like stop talking about eggs you freaks it's just fucking stupid just anybody being in a relationship at all is better than no better than the millions of single people who just don't have sex just the very fact that two straight people are together is good so st just stop calling it gay there's something wrong with you there really is um anyway uh let's um uh play an advert and then we'll get into uh there's a lot of interesting stuff in these two episodes that we're going to be looking at tonight suez a betrayal after World War II, a British decline, sneaky British plays against the Americans, Americans struggling with being the new hegemon. Uh, lots of really interesting details in this. Kissinger uh, makes an appearance uh, as a talking head. Loads of great stuff uh, tonight. But first of all, I'll remind people, do buy my courses at the academic agency. Buy it now. I'm trying to think of which advert to plug. Uh, maybe we'll have Foundations of Politics. Foundations of Politics. Only £350. Buy it now. See the world as it is and not how it ought to be. History is the graveyard of aristocracy. Who says organization says oligarchy? Who decides? Who interprets? The extremes of individualism and socialism meet. That was their predestined course. Foundations of politics. Only £350. Buy it now. All right, so... Let's get started then with um, the, now these episodes, the, the two we're going to watch here, 
cover an awful lot of ground. We 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 go from 1945 all the way basically to the to to the end of the 70s in the space of two hours. So there's a lot of material covered, a lot of uh, forgotten episodes during that. Um, what's fascinating about this series, Oceans Apart, is that the focus ostensibly is on the relationship between Britain and America, but we also get to l kind of go through a lot of the big milestones of 20th century history, but it, it, all of those things are in the background and what's in the foreground is what's happening with the, the so-called special relationship. Um, so, uh, yeah, what I really like about it is the it, the number of things that were happening at the time that seemed important to people that have just completely forgotten to the mists of time. You know, people remember Vietnam, but they remember the other little things that were going on, or they remember the Korean War, but not what was happening under the hood. So it's definitely been uh, very interesting. This first um, first documentary. Um, I also, I've come to appreciate the presence of David Dimbleby. Um, you know, I kind of, I mean, all right, David Dimbleby wasn't up for Brexit and, uh, he had a face like a, he was really miserable on that night when, uh, when Brexit happened and he, you know, maybe he's left wing or whatever. But to me, Dimbleby is what the BBC should be. He, 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 to me, is a symbol of what the old BBC was. And I kind of don't mind, okay, maybe he's, maybe there's a little bit of shit lib in there or whatever, but it's tolerable. It, you know, compared to the BBC of now, Dimbleby is like a, a shining beacon. And I think he's been great throughout this series. Um, so anyway, let's make a little start then on, uh, we're going to pick up, just after World War II here, and um, we're going to get into Lord Kane's begging and the Marshall Plan. Um, I mean, just before we get going, I usually give a kind of review um, of the episodes. Now, th these were not quite as strong as the last two episodes. I think the, the World War II episodes were particularly strong in this series. Uh, I think they are speeding up a little bit. There's a lot of skipping over you know 10 years past in the space of five minutes and things like that um but one thing i did appreciate uh and that slightly surprised me is the how can i put like there's this whole angle throughout this where initially the americans are keen for the british to lose their empire and to you know be anti-colonial and so on but as time goes on, they're starting to be like, shit, we're on our own. We have to run things. We're responsible for all of this now. And there's this whole narrative um, of the Americans actually not wanting the British to give away their empire as quickly as they were. And of the, of the Brits just kind of uh, giving up or absolving themselves of responsibility and being like, yeah, fuck this, we're, we're done. And uh, kind of quote unquote retiring from the great game. Um, really interesting uh, angle, which I was not quite ex expecting. Um, I also, I mean, I put American betrayal in the title, um, but I do think that the, uh, how can I put it? Um, successive British leaders always are looking for an angle to i don't know they're wily and um they don't always behave as the best of friends the british to the americans um so even though i put american betrayal in the title as a bit of clickbait um that is not the full story here there's definitely some betrayal after the second world war as we'll see but um uh I don't know. I don't think the. I don't think that Britain found it. It was all Britain's not was not at this period. We we can talk about how that has changed since Thatcher. 
uh, probably in the next episode. But certainly in this period that we're looking at here, just after the war and into the 70s, Britain was obviously not comfortable um, or fully comfortable in this kind of reduced position. And it was always looking to have a like, little bit of leverage or carve out some sort of position that wasn't completely uh, American poodle, you know. Um, I think this really changes with Thatcher. Um, I was particularly interested in the second of these two episodes, which is episode six, um, with the policies of Edward Heath and how Edward Heath comes across. Kind of a little bit more respect for Edward Heath, to be honest, after after watching this. Um, but anyway, let's uh, let's make a start. And um, obviously, we're not going to watch it all, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here. So I'm going to try to get as much in as I can in the next two hours. When London burned during the Blitz, it was said, America felt the flames. But Britain had borne the brunt of the war. Her cities bombed to rubble, her factories destroyed, her trade collapsed, her coffers empty. Nice one, Churchill. Definitely worth it, wasn't it? It was definitely, at least we're not speaking German, it was definitely worth it. Well, let's carry on. Her survival had only been possible because America had lent her millions of dollars. But a week after the surrender of Japan in August 1945, the new president of the United States, Harry Truman, announced that Lend-Lease was over. The oh, cheers. The flow of American money and goods stopped overnight, and Britain was on her own. The following day, the financial advisor to the British Treasury, Lord Keynes, warned the new Labour government that, in his words, Britain faced a financial Dunkirk. If American aid wasn't resumed immediately, the chances were that the country would literally go bankrupt. Keynes was sent here to see if he could persuade the Americans to give immediate help. He arrived to a country that was jubilant, welcoming back the boys from the war, but he soon discovered that he couldn't expect a hero's welcome. The view in America was that the war had been fought to a successful conclusion and that Britain had no further claim on its generosity. I, I mean, to be serious for a second, I do think from the American point of view, it was like, I mean, I I, I think it was stupid from the British point of view, just the war altogether was a stupid idea. But from the American point of view, it was like they were kind of roped in. So I can kind of understand their attitude as well, to be honest. <laughs> the Yanks, back to America from the battlefields of Europe and Africa. Foot soldiers and tankmen and airmen and gunners. Veterans of the Tunisian desert, of the beachheads of Italy and Normandy, of skies over Germany, the mountains of Tuscany, the mud of France. The British government's emissary, Lord Keynes, arrived in America in the wake of the returning troops. His mission was urgent, to persuade a country that had prospered during the war that some of that wealth must be shared with Britain if she was to survive. Good luck, Lord Keynes. <laughs> Throughout the war, the United States, while fighting as a close ally of Britain, had been suspicious of her motives, thinking that among them was to emerge from the war with the British Empire and Britain's trading position intact. It was assumed that once the war was... I mean, is that not a fair aim? I mean, potentially stupid to think you could do both, but still, the idea that Britain would have its own interests is not that... It's not, it's not that, uh, you know, it's not like it's evil or anything. 
It's over, the old economic rivalry with America, which had been disrupted by Hitler, would be resumed. Waiting to meet Keynes was a businessman who worked for the State Department called Will Clayton. He believed that Britain, with her empire, couldn't possibly be as poor as she was claiming to be. And he thought it was time that she put away the begging bowl. He was the biggest cotton dealer in the world. He was an honorable Texan. He was a believer in pure competition. He really believed that Britain should be given an amount of money that would not offend Congress too much, and no more. It then should be on its own as a competitive society uh, in a competitive world. They asked for $3,750,000,000 million as a gift on the basis, they said, Lord Keane said, that they had fought uh, earliest and uh, longest. Now, that was true, but that's not the way you approach uh, your banker for money. <laughs> and that's what we were talking about, was money. The thought was, well, uh, gee whiz, uh, what are the crown jewels worth? How, <laughs> what kind of security can we get for this loan? Uh, what is it going to be used for? Uh, those who wanting the money were very uh, nebulous about answering that question. Uh, a lot of us thought that uh, it would be used to subsidize socialism in Great Britain. <laughs> that, is, that is probably true, given the Attlee government that was about to come in. So, <laughs> Which we didn't think would be a particular favor to our friends. The war was over. And now uh, the people were sick and tired of it and to, didn't want to hear any more about it. America was busy looking after her own needs. I, I mean, to, to, to be fair, the Keynes' argument was piss poor, if that really was. You know, oh, yeah, we, we fought long and hard. We fought hardest. And we were there first, you know, give us $3 billion. I mean, the Americans were never, ever going to give that money <laughs> strings. Uh, you know, they were never going to do it. Just get real. And a I mean, the, 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 the point is, is that Britain should never have been reduced to that status in the first place. Because we should never have even, you just accept the peace deal in 1940 or whatever, which is what Churchill should have done the minute, the minute the mid-century Germans held that hand out, just bite the hand off. And it, it would never have been in this situation in the first place. But no. We'll never surrender. I fucking hate Churchill. I really do. Because he basically created that exact... This entire scenario is of his creation. That belligerence, basically. Opinion polls showed 60% were against giving Britain help. The American negotiators drove a hard bargain. If Britain wanted to borrow... See, I'm not surprised that the Americans had, were 60% against it because from their point of view, they did, don't forget, the Americans didn't, the majority of Americans, what was it, over 75% of Americans, didn't want to go into World War II in the first place. Now, now after being roped in, Britain's asking for another three billion. Like, of course, most of the public is going to be like, what? We've already, we already went and won the war for you from their point of view, I'm saying. So I'm just saying that it's kind of like, I mean, it's just obvious that it was going to play out like this. She must lower trade barriers to American goods and pay interest on the loan. There was an outcry in Britain. The Economist magazine wrote, it is aggravating to find that the reward for losing a quarter of our national wealth in the common cause is to pay tribute to those who have been enriched by the war. Beggars cannot be choosers, but they can put a curse on the ambitions of the rich. There was no option. There was no option. We had denuded ourselves of our resources. We had uh, our exports trade had sunk to one third of what it was in 1939. I mean, I'm just saying, like, the extent of the damage, was it worth it? Was it worth, I mean, we're talking like huge, huge losses 
a, a complete destruction of the British economy and British power and British standing in the world to take out the evil dictator. I mean, come on. Um, we would have really entered a period of tremendous austerity if we had not accepted the loan. Victory had left America not only richer, but more powerful, as sole possessor of the world's most destructive weapon, the atomic bomb. British and American scientists had worked together on its development during the war, and a secret agreement between Roosevelt and Churchill promised that cooperation would continue once the war was over. But in 1946, Congress passed the McMahon Act. It made cooperation on atomics with any country, Britain included, an act of treason. What's that? Churchill made a really shit deal, which was then immediately reneged on by the Americans. Brilliant. Another fantastic bit of work by by Winnie C. I mean, seriously, the worst leader this country's ever had. It's just amazing how bad he is. Um, also, a little bit dishonourable of the Americans to renege on that on that deal, but still. The McMahon Act was a great blow to Britain. There's no, there's no doubt about it because uh, historically, uh, British scientists and the British government. Uh, thought they had played, as indeed they had in many respects, uh, a major role uh, in the whole uh, foundation and use of nuclear power for both uh, military and, and peaceful purposes. And there was a pervasive belief that there was an agreement between uh, the uh, uh, British Prime Minister Churchill and Roosevelt that we would go on collaborating after the war. And of course, after the war, the whole thing was shut down uh, by the Americans. I think basically uh, because the fact that the two bombs had gone off had had such horrific uh, consequences. There was this deep-rooted issue in Britain uh, that why uh, we who had been in at the birth of this, why we were being denied it. Britain felt betrayed by Truman's decision. Treated. <laughs> well, it was a fucking betrayal. I mean, you, you'd get, if you were playing a game, you'd get like Oathbreaker or, or uh, you know, broke our deal minus, minus 20 points for 50 years. If you were playing Civilization, but anyway. ...of what was hers by right. Not to have the bomb, the government's scientific advisor said, would make the British like native levies who were allowed small arms, but not artillery. Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin put it even more bluntly. We've got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs. We've got to have the bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. That stupid McMahon Act provisions... Can I just say one thing, by the way, right? Even though these guys were socialists, Clement Attlee and Bevin and all those guys... Without a shadow of a doubt, the Labour government of this period was a hundred times more base than the Tories, than Churchill and all those wankers. Seriously, these guys impressed me during this during this documentary, and they even back then Labour were more base than the Tories, more spine, more robust, more patriotic. The whole the whole caboodle. They're acting fully with them, and. Uh... The kind of way at the time they were all actors. Think they were the big boys, we were the small boys. We just got to show them. They didn't know everything. To put it brutally, frankly, we were betrayed in nearly all the promises we had exacted from America over atomic energy sharing of, over the continuation of Lend-Lease over the uh, Anglo-American loan. And all those three things were forgotten and the obligations were not carried out. Did you feel that Britain... Pro proper scumbag behaviour from the Americans uh, directly after World War II here. 
just, just, I mean, there's just, how do they justify it? Oh, yeah. Don't like, don't fancy honoring that deal anymore. Fuck it. Brilliant. He was impotent by now in the relationship. Yes. Nothing they could do. Nothing. The BBC presents the distinguished novelist, E.M. Forster, who is going to talk about his impressions of America. Mr. Forster. Although the Americans I encountered were full of charitable feelings towards Great Britain, I cannot say that they showed much interest in us otherwise. I've often been asked since my return home, what do they think about us over there? Indeed, it's often the only thing English people seem to want to know. The answer, not very flattering to our pride, is that the Americans scarcely think about us at all. They're curious about our royal family. They are grateful and appreciative towards Mr. Churchill. They are or were enthusiastic over British films. That's all. In 1946, the one Briton who could arouse interest in America and command an audience came over on a visit. One of the original big three, Britain's former Prime Minister Winston Spencer Churchill... Churchill had been defeated as Prime Minister in the election a year earlier. New York gave... But by the way, I always find it fascinating that Churchill was immediately voted out. <laughs> I mean, that shows you how popular he was in the country. Immediately voted out. Um, but there he is. There he is doing his tour of America. And uh, if you're interested in some of the details behind this, Thomas77, uh, I got a buddy called Pete Quinones who did a whole series with Thomas77 on Churchill. And I'm pretty sure he says that this speech that, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's specifically this speech, but it's one of these speeches that he gives on Russia. On Russia. He had one speech prepared. He was given like some sort of different briefing and then he gave a completely different speech when he arrived. It was like one was pro-Russian. Then he was like, oh, no, actually, here's my anti anti-commie anti Russia speech. And he had it prepared. Just like Boris had the pro-Brexit and anti-Brexit speeches both prepared. Very fitting that Churchill is Boris's uh, hero. Anyway, here he is. Utter scumbag. Him a triumphal welcome. But his invitation was to speak in the president's home state at Fulton, Missouri. Truman and he traveled there together by train. Mr. Churchill was mellow and waxing rhetorical. And I remember so well I could, all, I could give it practically word for word. He said, if I were to be born again, I would like to be born in the United States of America. He said, that is the country of the future. Great Britain has had its day. He said, you Yeah, thanks to you, fucking Churchill. Britain's had its day thanks to you. <laughs> I hate this man. I really hate this man. Sorry. You know, there was a time when the sun never set upon the British Empire. But that's all changing now. Nations rise to eminence, and then after a while, why, they slowly decline. They, they decline because of you. I fucking hate this guy. I really hate him. <laughs> oh, man. All right, I'm, no, I'm going to try not to say anything for a while. And he said that has happened to Great Britain. Now the United States is in the ascendancy. And he said this is the nation of the future, and I would like to be part of it. The speech Churchill was to give at Fulton would warn America that Russia could no longer be looked on as the benevolent ally of the war. America must wake up to the threat of possible Russian aggression in Europe before it was too late. He used a stark image to illustrate his fears. A shadow had fallen upon the scenes so lately lightened, lighted by the... Again, facilitated by you. I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> Literally, the shadow has fallen, facilitated by you. Unbelievable. I just, I can't, I, it, the, the sheer gall of this guy. 
oh yeah, America's the country of the future, Britain's in decline, and Russia is risen. B brackets, this is my legacy to the world. All of these things. Allied victory. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. With the phrase Iron Curtain, Churchill evoked a disturbing new image, creating for the American people a vision of a world not at peace, but divided into two hostile camps. He urged America to unite with Britain, sharing all their military resources as the only hope of protecting the world from communist domination. British moral and material forces and convictions are... I mean, just to put this in perspective, he completely destroyed Britain's economy to the point where the most powerful nation in the world had to then beg, like we just heard about, Lord Keynes had to literally beg for money to, to at the feet of the Americans. Churchill did this, okay? And he did it by destroying, totally destroying, the one man in Europe who set his sights on destroying communism. Do you understand? The whole mid-century German, the whole rise of fascism in, in Europe was an anti-communist force. He put all of Britain's resources into destroying that force. And now he's saying, oh, we fail. oh no, oh no. The threat of communism now. What a fucking twat. Join with your own in fraternal association. The high roads of the future will be clear. Not only for us, but for all. Not only for our time, but for a century to come. First reactions to Churchill's speech were hostile. The last thing the American people wanted was to be drawn into new alliances. Roosevelt had promised that a turbulent world could be kept in order by the United Nations, and they preferred to put their trust in that. What changed their attitude to Britain was not fear of Russia, but a far older enemy, the British weather. England today. England caught in the cold grip of economic crisis. The sea, frozen for the first time since 1929, is symbolic of England's ever-present gloom. One observer has charged that without vast changes, the crisis may become a steady slide into conditions of poverty unknown in the Western world in modern times. The newsreels shown in America offered proof that Britain was no longer a political rival, but a country dangerously near collapse. In the last straw, here with compressed air drills, parsnips are harvested. And here on this frozen island, a little piece of coal becomes of great importance. The Labour government were faced with an industrial and financial crisis. The dollars provided under the loan were nearly exhausted and government spending had to be cut back. One target was the British troops stationed abroad. 16,000 were involved in a costly war against communist guerrillas in Greece and more were based in Turkey. The British Treasury was demanding they be withdrawn. Despite the risk of the two countries going communist, Britain, it was argued, could no longer sustain an imperial posture. But here in the Foreign Office, a different view was taken. Here, the British lion still roared. Ernest Bevin, Labour's new Foreign Secretary, whose bus still dominates this entrance hall, was a socialist. He'd come up through the trade union movement. But when it came to Britain's world role, he took a very traditional view. He believed that Britain was still and must remain a world power. Britain's interests in the empire in the Near and Far East demanded that Greece and Turkey must be protected. And if Britain had to pull out, then somebody else had to be found to go in. The only person who could was America. He decided to scare them. He told the British Embassy in Washington to inform the State Department that within six weeks, Britain was going to pull all her troops out of Greece and Turkey. 
and to say that if those two countries fell to communism, dire consequences would follow not for Britain, but for America. He certainly laid it on pretty thick. Either you want the Russians uh, on the Dardanelles and coming out of the Black Sea into the Eastern Mediterranean, or else you take over, and there's no other alternative. Immediately, in the State Department, notified the President, the Secretary of State, and uh, uh, went into a deep study of what we could do about it. Because uh, you may remember, the British note said, in effect, that if Turkey is to be saved, you or somebody else is going to have to do it because we're just fresh out of money. So I, th I thought it was this was pretty interesting, kind of like a um, little bit of backseat driving American foreign po foreign policy here. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, just couldn't afford imperial imperial rule anymore, but um, basically like forcing America to pick up the reins. I find that kind of interesting, uh, very interesting indeed. Did he hesitate when he made the decision? Oh, sure. He took a, a number of days of thinking it over with great care. He, he uh, <clears throat> I think his first reaction, I'm not sure that he said so, maybe I'm just giving my, my reaction was, this really is not our problem. Truman was in a dilemma. America's political tradition argued against involvement. American presidents had always been guided by George Washington's advice to avoid foreign entanglements. But many of Truman's advisers thought he faced a new kind of threat and believed he should break with the past and follow the lead given by Churchill in his Fulton speech. I thought the speech was excellent. And I thought that it was important that the people in the world begin to understand what we had found out, how difficult the Soviets were going to be after the war was over. We'd been allies during the war, and President Truman thought we could carry right on with that same kind of an alliance. There were only... I mean, I, I do get the little bit of a, the, the sense that um, Britain is just kind of handing America poison chalices here. You know, I'm reminded of the uh, the hollow crown speech from Shakespeare. You know, heavy is the hollow crown that sits on the, you know, i.e. being the hegemon comes with a whole new set of headaches. And it's kind of interesting that the Americans, like initially at least, kind of didn't want it. Um, but it, it, this is an interesting th theme throughout this episode of the British being like, yeah, we're fucking done with this now. Your turn. Um, almost like it's a bit, you know, it's a burden, basically. Um, the responsibility of it is actually a pain in the ass. So interesting. And the Americans kind of being reluctant because they want to pursue isolationism, which is in many ways natural for America to want to pursue. Two great powers in the world, and he thought if we could win the war, maybe we could fashion a peace that would be lasting. It proved not to be so. Stalin had entirely different ideas. This, then, is the situation with which we have to deal. Greece and Turkey are in urgent need of aid, and there is no other country to which they may turn. The argument for American... I, I, I'm going to skip on a bit here, because I don't want to watch like the whole thing, but basically the upshot is that America gets roped into uh, sorting out this Greece and Turkey situation which is basically america's first taste of becoming the new hegemon becoming like dealing with the problems of empire essentially um so that's an interesting like transition uh really let's uh watch a bit of this bit of this bit now because uh situations deteriorating in Britain. So let's have a little watch of this. Wrote in April 1947, it is clear that we have completely misjudged the situation. Millions of people are slowly starving. Without immediate substantial aid from the United States, Europe faces economic, social and political disintegration. 
In June 1947, the American Secretary of State, George Marshall, made a speech in which he offered Europe substantial American help. To Britain, who had now used up her earlier loan, the offer of assistance came just in time. Our situation was so difficult, both financially, militarily, in every other way, that really we had no alternative. We either had to hang on to the American uh, uh, apron strings, or else literally go down the drain. And I don't mean by that merely go down from being a first-class power to a third-class power, but I mean really how are we going to feed people? There was only one condition Marshall insisted on. The Europeans must plan their recovery together. Britain took the lead. Bevin summoned a meeting in Paris of European foreign ministers. He told them they must seize the opportunity and unite, or face disaster. If misfortune befalls us, then we shall descend to still lower levels of e economic activity, from which it will be all the harder to raise ourselves, and which is likely to pull down by its sheer weight the economic structure of many other parts of the world. The British government, prepared for the worst, had already set up a secret committee to plan a famine food program for Britain in case help did not come through. Each citizen would be entitled to a ration of 1,760 calories a day, over 500 calories less than they'd eaten during the worst days of the war. What would have happened if Marshall Plan aid had Well, it's anybody's guess. I suppose we would have had a gradual, I think it's very likely, a, a pretty rapid takeover of Italy and France by communist or communist dominated or communist coalition type of government. What would have happened here, heaven knows. We would probably have had some riots. We would probably have had a steady swing of the uh, government to, to the left. Eventually, I suppose, might possibly the same thing that happened on the continent. Now, uh, the people in charge at that time and the Americans regarded that prospect as a disastrous one. If it can succeed, it will help stop World War III before it starts. It will prevent America's isolation in a communist world. It is a plan for peace, stability, and freedom. As such, it involves the clear self-interest of our own United States. In April 1948, Truman, watched by senior members of Congress, all now convinced of the communist threat, signed the bill. Marshall aid would provide millions of dollars of help to Britain and to Europe. Soon, supplies of food, farm machinery and steel were arriving at British docks, all stamped from the USA. In Britain, news of aid ships on their way brought hopes of a break in the grey skies of austerity. Well, I suppose you'll soon have lots of cigarettes with this American aid, won't you? American aid? I can't say I've thought about it much. Not really. But I do hope it doesn't mean a war with Russia. Of course it doesn't. Though it should do a lot to stop communism spreading in Europe. Damn good thing. Dolly, do you think this American aid is a good thing? I've no idea. you better ask your father. I... <laughs> Best answer ever. <laughs> Much to do. There needs to be more of that. I've got no idea. Should ask your father. I, wa I, I, I want to hear Mrs. A.A. saying that more and more. Two months after martial aid became law, America and Western Europe faced a crisis of the sort they feared. In protest over Allied moves to make West Germany a separate state, the Soviet Union blockaded all routes into Berlin, cutting the city off from the outside world. It was an extraordinarily serious time. The United States could not permit this to occur. Berlin belonged to all of the Allies, and we all were to join together in governing Berlin. The president got his military advisor. So I'm going I'm to skip over this bit because it's, uh, you know, some Cold War stuff, uh, basically. But um, I want to get now. Little bit, I'm going to skip on a little bit because I want to get to um, some of the anti communist stuff that goes on. The anti communist fervor in America. Let's go from about here. 
Refrain from offering moral and ideological advice. The day is not far off when we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts. The less we're hampered then by idealistic slogans. Oh, in fact, this is a good speech. Let me go back. This was a good... This was uh, George Kennan. I actually thought that George Kennan was kind of based, to be honest, in this uh, in this one speech. I thought, Kennan sounds like a man after my own... <laughs> my own heart, a kind of realist. So let's listen to that. ...by the United States in peacetime. It was what Churchill had called for at Fulton three years earlier. But only think of oil. New Jersey dance, go up in flames. If someone mentions bed. In Chicago, Illinois, any girl who meets a boy giggles and shoots him dead. But I like America, it's society. But this was a different America from the one Churchill had known. A senior diplomat, George Kennan, wrote of America's future role in the world, we should dispense with the aspiration to be liked or to be regarded as the repository of a high-minded international altruism. We should refrain from offering moral and ideological advice. Yes! I, I wish more people would think like this today. The day is not far off when we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts. Yes. The less we're hampered then by idealistic slogans, the better. I like America. I have traveled far from the bumble of the America's power was supreme because of her possession of the atomic bomb. But in 1949, an event occurred which challenged that comfortable lead and heralded a change in America's relationship with Britain. Well, I was then assistant to Dean Acheson, and uh, we were in New York, as we frequently were, for the opening of the UN, and we usually stayed for several weeks, and I shared a suite with him at the Waldorf. He came in in late afternoon and or early evening, and he said, do you have any problems sleeping? I said, none at all. He said, well, let me tell you something that I think might keep you awake tonight. And he said, the Soviets have just exploded their first uh, nuclear bomb. Well, we were devastated. Life had changed, and we knew it, but we didn't really know precisely how. America prepares to face attack on its cities and industrial centers under a combined civilian defense program. Any community is vulnerable to possible bombing, including the final threat of the devastating atom. Shelters the mood of panic that swept through America was heightened by the news a month later that the communists had gained power in China. Americans suddenly felt hemmed in by what they saw as a political conspiracy organized by Russia. And atomic bomb destruction. The next shock came early in 1950. Al Jahis, former High State Departmental official, is branded a communist spy by an American jury after a sensational trial. And worse news followed, this time from their closest ally, Britain. One of the, one of the people we dealt with rather frequently at the embassy was Derek Carr Miller, Sir Derek Carr Miller. And he always had a cheery manner about him. He'd arrive and say, do we have any fresh horrors today? And I said, yes, we got a few. This day he had his own. This fresh horror was a real one. He said that a fellow, a German who was working at, uh, in the British program, who had communist connections, who had been with the team that came to this country, had been at Los Alamos and elsewhere, had sat in on the final session on the super, the H-bomb. He had defected to the Soviet Union. Klaus Fuchs had worked as a scientist at the heart of the American defense program on the atomic bomb. It was beginning to look as though America was riddled with communists. Communism in reality is not a political... Riddled with communists. One of the very interesting things about this documentary, by the way, is that it doesn't do the usual mainstream kind of history thing of making fun of McCarthy or the hysteria reds under the bed or any of that sort of stuff. Um, he literally just said America was riddled with communists. So kind of interesting um, that they took this line in this documentary. Political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. 
It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. What reaction did Britain have to the signs of growing anti-communism in the United States? I think up to a point, we, we thought this was, was healthy, that the Americans were going to take up the white man's burden everywhere. But it, then it began... The white man's burden. ...and to take forms which we thought were rather unhealthy. Uh, we soon began to feel that this was getting a bit out of hand. Something is happening in the peaceful little town of Mosani. Yes, this place is Mosani in the United States of America. And it's only make-believe as they stage a fake 24-hour occupation by fifth columnists. And this is what happens to a newspaper editor who operates under a free press. Those unfavorable to the regime are marched away. Of course, America believes that this could never happen within the borders of her free country, but peaceful Mosadi shows what it looked like when they pretended it did. The same newsreel showed the British Prime Minister on a goodwill tour of American Air Force bases in Britain. But privately, his government was increasingly alarmed over America's behavior and worried what it might lead to. Can you imagine Clement Attlee's on a plane called Nifty Fifty? <laughs> Closely knit strength of Anglo American. Was there a, a, a clear difference in approach between Britain and America towards the Soviet threats? I think there was, you see. For one thing, we didn't accept the American view that there was this great uh, Russo Chinese monolith that um, Stalin was, was running Mao Zedong and uh, all the communists right down into Vietnam, that the whole thing was, 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 uh, was solid. We didn't believe that. I mean, containment was one. Yeah, I mean, typical American... Uh, Americans always think like that, that all their enemies are actually one. They, they, they're still like that now. Yeah, I mean, you heard um, Nancy Pelosi the other day saying that Vladimir Putin was behind the the uh, the pro Palestinian protesters uh, behind Biden. I don't know why Americans always have this habit of thinking that all of their enemies are actually in, are actually just one entity. Um, you know, they, they they do it in the in the Middle East. Like every single every single bomb that goes off is a iranium backed you know i don't know why it's just part of their mindset for some reason one thing but to ring the soviet union with bases uh these of course were in the days when all atom bombs and other bombs were delivered by aircraft um this might get out of hand The problem for Britain centred on the use of bases like this one at Mildenhall, and in particular the possibility of an American atomic attack being launched from them. There was no formal agreement with Britain over what the bases could be used for. No British say in where these planes went once they'd taken off, nor what weapons they carried. What happened if America were to mount an atomic attack that Britain opposed? And not just from here. Suppose there was an atomic attack from any American base anywhere in the world. Wouldn't the Russians be bound to retaliate against this British Air Force base? Interestingly, it was a question that was put by the very architect of the alliance itself, Ernest Bevan. On the 15th of March, 1950, at the Cabinet Defence Committee, he said... But by the way, I will say that Ernest Bevan comes out of this documentary pretty well uh, versus Churchill who wouldn't ask any of those questions. I, I guarantee you, Churchill would not have asked the same questions that Bevan is asking here. How could we secure our own position if the Americans ever wanted to conduct active operations from the United Kingdom airfields before the United Kingdom was at war? He ordered a top secret paper to be prepared on this, asking whether the Americans should be asked there's a guy in the chat saying, hey, hey, you are an intellectual. You are incapable of understanding how normal people think. Multiple enemies is too difficult to intellectualize, so they create one big enemy. 
Yes, Richard, but I'm not talking about normal people. I'm talking about the United States State Department and the people in the United States government who shouldn't be normal people. They should be people who have a pretty nuanced understanding of the enemies they're dealing with. So I'm not talking about Joe Public. I'm talking about the State Department. Uh, anyway, let's carry on. Asked ...to leave these bases. It was drawn up by a senior Foreign Office official, Evelyn Shapra. The question was whether the cabinet would would agree, should agree to them being permanently here. And of course there were hesitations. Even in those early days, there was a beginning of a fear about uh, whether letting the Americans be here meant that we would not be able to control an atomic war starting from this island. Shagbra's paper to cabinet exposed the government's dilemma in allowing this island to become a main forward base for American strategic bombing, he wrote, we increase the likelihood of becoming a target for Russian atomic attack. There were all these uh, possible objections to this thing, but as I recall, um, there was an overriding consideration, namely that Europe couldn't survive without the American alliance, and that we really had to play such part as the alliance wanted us to play, and that included, uh, not only for us, but for other European countries, having American forces stationed in our territory. Occupied, basically. Occupied. You mean you had to do what the Americans wanted, in effect? Up to a point, yes. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But what is happening there is important to every American. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard, more than ever before, against this kind of sneak attack. The Korean War exacerbated Britain's anxiety. Fought in the name of the United Nations, the war was in reality under American control. Many in the United States government saw it as a diversionary tactic by China and Russia. The first of many great, uh, many great war campaigns by the Americans, eh? The Korean War. The prelude to an all-out communist assault on Western Europe. Within days of the outbreak of war, the American Atomic Energy Commission, controllers of the nuclear arsenal, asked the president's permission to send atomic bomb components to Britain. The core of the bombs would be left in America, but could be shipped out in 24 hours if nuclear war was imminent. With Truman's permission obtained, the components were prepared to be flown from Los Alamos. Britain was not formally asked or informed. The Americans wanted a swift decision. The Secretary of the Air Force wrote to the Secretary of Defense, I know the British well enough to know that sometimes they can be very slow, and this strategic countermeasure cannot afford to hold itself up while the British cabinet is debating about things. <laughs> In those days, what we didn't shot. have ICBMs. We needed a, a place to take off from to hit the Soviet Union. So was it seriously being considered in July 1950? No, just preparation. But I would remind you that back in 1948, General Marshall, who was then Secretary of State, asked me in one day and said, if we go to war with the Soviet Union with atomic weapons, should we bomb Leningrad? That was at 48 during the Berlin crisis, so that possibility hasn't been out of our minds at any, any length of time. They had converted some of the B-29s in what they were commonly called at that time, nicknamed silver plates, and then they were used to ferry units from the United States over to England. Well, as soon as we'd land, they would uh, more or less take the aircraft out of our hands and move it into this classified area and it was offloaded. It used to stretch, you could see it stretch a shroud around it. And... So I'm just going to skip on a little bit because uh, we get to the Suez crisis soon. Uh, let's get to that um, and Churchill coming back, I think. Um, let's get to that because Churchill really is a pathetic shell of a man when he comes back here. 51 Churchill is even more pathetic than 40, 45 Churchill. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's get to Suez. 
purposes, which if they thought that the national security was at stake. Attlee kept the details of his discussion deliberately vague. I have received assurances, he said, which I consider to be perfectly satisfactory. The British Chiefs of Staff were not satisfied. Field Marshal Slim complained he was unclear what consultation really meant. Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Slessor, said, the present situation whereby the United States could launch atomic bomb attacks on Russia using UK bases without giving any indication of their plans is intolerable. At the end of 1951, a general election was held in Britain. As the overnight results came in, it was clear that the Labour Party, which had been in power for six years, had been defeated. The electorate had returned the Conservatives to office. Uh. They were led by an elder statesman convinced that the intimate relationship between Britain and America, which he had done so much to create, could be restored. We're talking about a period when we had in power Winston Churchill and Eden, who'd had the war and the Great Alliance with the Roosevelt and all that. And Truly, this next bit coming up is pathetic, by the way. Pathetic, but let's, uh, let's watch. We really couldn't get that out of their heads. And I think they were bitterly upset and disappointed that, that they weren't getting the same kind of backing uh, in the 1950s that they'd had then. And then, or, or they weren't getting the same relationship with the United States that they'd had then. It was rather tragic, really. Oh, Churchill used to sort of appeal for it. And then uh, it dropped like a lead balloon sometimes. Um, just so... Uh, it's just... really is just... Uh. I wonder if I ought to tell you something. I was at a meeting uh, in, in Washington, which I remember because it's in my diary. Um, Churchill suddenly made an impassioned plea for Anglo-American uh, cooperation and this great tradition we'd had and all that kind of thing. And President Truman said, uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. We might pass that to our advisors for further consideration. <laughs> Well, we felt very distressed by that. Just, just, just a shell of a man, Churchill, at this point. All his bullshit, all his rhetoric, all his special relationship, all just utter bullshit, isn't it? Churchill returned home aboard the liner Queen Elizabeth. Asked to comment on his visit, he found it difficult to disguise his disappointment. Well, may we have your personal reactions on the success of your trip to America? I tell you that uh, I'm sure that by trying our best in the United States uh, to make uh, good understandings and solid agreements possible between us, we have not uh, entirely failed. And. Cope. Uh, it would be a great mistake to suppose that everything happens all at once. And after all, nothing comes before. A new Middle East crisis arises as President Nasser of Egypt tells a wildly cheering crowd in Alexandria that Egypt has seized the internationally owned Suez Canal. Is the Suez Canal was jointly owned by Britain and France. NASA's nationalization of the waterway was seen by Anthony Eden, Churchill's successor as Prime Minister, as a threat to Britain's empire. NASA's thumb is on our windpipe, he said. Eden believed Britain had to protect her interests. He saw Can I just say, this Eden poster is very George Orwell, isn't it? How, how Orwellian is that Eden poster? Did you watch it again? NASA's thumb is on our windpipe, he said. Eden believed Britain had to protect her interests. He saw it as a test of Britain's claim to be a world power able to act independently of the United States. It looked rather different from America. Secretary of State Dulles hurried to London to prevent any precipitate action by Britain. He feared that a British attack on Egypt would push the Arab world to seek help from Russia. But Eden ignored Dulles. Instead, he conspired with France and Israel. It was agreed that Israel would attack Egypt and feigning surprise, Britain and France would move in to separate them by seizing the canal. The Americans were kept in ignorance. Uh, I think the best we hoped for was that they might turn a blind eye. 
but of course, the way in which we did it, the subterfuges, the lies, the deceptions, and so on, both of the Americans and of the United Nations and of the House of Commons, that shocked the Americans so, so much, and shocked in particular Eisenhower, that we hadn't a hope of, of getting even American neutrality, even a blind eye from the Americans. I mean, from, from the moment we went in for that sort of approach, uh, it was a question of, of, of the Americans opposing us root and branch, as they did. On October the 31st, Israel duly invaded Egypt, and Britain dispatched a seaborne invasion force. In America, President Eisenhower was in the middle of an election campaign and was handling a different crisis, Russia's invasion of Hungary. Eisenhower's condemnation of Russia was undermined by his allies' use of force against Egypt. He summoned a press conference, but before he spoke to it, he went into a private room at the White House with his Secretary of State, Dulles, and called Anthony Eden in Downing Street. I picked up the phone and said yes, and it was Eisenhower, I thought it would be the ambassador. It was Eisenhower, and he said, is that you, Anthony? To which I said, no, rather lowly. And he went straight on, not caring to listen, and said, well, this is President Eisenhower, surprising way of introducing himself, and I can only presume that you have gone out of your mind. He really had lost his temper completely, virtually declaring war on Britain. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. It is our hope and intent that this matter will be brought before the United Nations General Assembly. There, with no veto operating, the opinion of the world can be brought to bear in our quest for a just end to this tormenting problem. Eisenhower, determined to stop Britain in her tracks, sent Dulles to the United Nations to call for a ceasefire. I doubt that any delegate ever spoke from this forum with as heavy a heart as I have brought here tonight. He thought if, if the world was ever going to get better, you, had, you couldn't have a double standard. You couldn't have one standard for your opponents and one standard for your friends. And he's... <laughs> I mean, what the fuck does that mean? What happened to the Schmittian exception? I mean, they've got two. I mean, they've got double standards for Israel today. So, what happened to that? I mean, anyway. So, and you wouldn't let your opponents engage in gunboat diplomacy anymore. The Egyptians had done something that was very unpleasant, very unattractive, very unconducive to good international relations. But it wasn't illegal because they had offered to pay for it. And in view, in view of the fact it wasn't illegal, he didn't think. You invaded. That was gunboat diplomacy. We wouldn't put up with it as the Russians tried it, and he didn't think we should put up with it as our friends. The American ceasefire motion was carried overwhelmingly, 64 to 5. The Soviet Union voted with the United States. Undeterred, Britain carried on with a seaborne landing, and fighting broke out for control of the canal at Port Said. Eisenhower, now safely re-elected, acted quickly to force Britain to withdraw from Suez. He used not America's military might, but its economic strength. One effect of Suez had been a sterling crisis. Holders of pounds were selling them feverishly for dollars. Eisenhower instructed his secretary to the Treasury, George Humphreys, to contact the British cabinet, which was in emergency session. And he said, Rab, if you don't carry out the United Nations resolution, we cannot help with money to save the pound. I said I thought that was blackmail all on the telephone. No doubt other people were listening. He said he didn't mind what I called it, but that was the truth. And the fact is that the British cabinet did decide to carry out the United Nations request. Well, I think what we failed to take into account was how effectively the Americans could uh, stop us in our tracks. Using the sly economic methods to humiliate their supposed allies here. Uh, what we failed to take into account was the run on sterling. Uh, what we failed to take into account was 
uh, that the Suez Canal would be blocked. Uh, and Because how dare Britain and France have a foreign policy which was not approved by the American president? Yeah. So this was it. This was the moment where basically it became official that Britain, France, and every other country in Europe is just a vassal state of America because if you cannot decide who you go to war with, you are not sovereign, essentially. This is what Eisenhower did here. Uh, therefore, uh, once the Suez Canal was blocked, because we depended on the Americans for oil, and we didn't have the dollars to pay for the oil, and the Americans wouldn't lend us the dollars. None of that was foreseen. And now, can I just say, uh, thank you very much for all your kindness to me, all of you, during my period of office. I wish my successor all good fortune. And Godspeed to you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. With the collapse of the Suez action... I mean, basically the last the last prime minister, if you want to put it that way, because all of them since have just basically been viceroys of the American empire, if you want to put it that way. ...and Eden's resignation, the Anglo-American relationship had hit a new low. Some thought it had come to an end. I've just been looking at the American magazine Time. There's a couple of letters in it I think that uh, you might be interested to hear. The first is from a Mr. L. Thompson of Beckenham, England. In any English pub, the vast majority of people will quite openly say that the sooner we British get out of the alliance with the Americans, the better. Based. The second is from Mr. R.J. Rogers of Indianapolis, USA. I see that American aid will be needed to bail the English and French out of this mess. The money will come from the usual place, the pocket of the American taxpayer. So now we Americans are unpopular over there. Well, okay, old buddies, if you don't like our peaches, quit shaking our tree. So there we go. Um, and let's now, this next episode, I think, is more. I think the kind of Suez stuff and the post world war stuff is kind of well worn. This next episode has a lot more kind of hidden history in it, I think. So let's, uh, let's carry on. An ocean apart is made possible in part by British Airways, whose club class delivers the business traveler ready to do business. Hanson, a company which has provided basic goods and services since 1964 and attained increased profits, dividends... It, the letter from the guy in the pub, by the way, uh, speaks to something that Scrump always, Scrump and Evelyn say, which is that in the pubs of the country, you can always, the working man of the pub, always has the most base takes of any person in the country. So it's kind of true. Anyway, let's uh, let's start this next one. In December 1956, the British Army was withdrawn from Egypt and returned home. The lion's tail was between its legs. The attempt to recapture the Suez Canal from Nasser had ended in military and political confusion. Britain had been humiliated by the country she thought of as her ally, the United States. Great ally, great friend. It had denounced her at the United Nations and ordered her to withdraw her troops or risk the collapse of the pound. Prime Minister Eden resigned and his successor tried to lift the nation's spirits. Now, this is one of the copious things said in the history of British politics. Check this out for pure cope from Macmillan here. Every now and again since the war, I've heard people say, isn't Britain only a second or third class power now? Isn't she on the way out? What nonsense. This is a great country, so don't let's be ashamed to say so. Just, just... Uh Total cope, basically. But what, what I mean, what else was he meant to say? Harold Macmillan's attempt to bolster British morale couldn't disguise the scale of the defeat that Britain had suffered at Suez. Her claim to be a world power able to defend her own interests had been proved to be a sham. The United States had demonstrated that it could and would intervene to frustrate Britain's aims 
if they came into conflict with its own. That American intervention had been a success, but it had left Britain's alliance with her oldest, closest, most powerful friend in tatters. Harold Macmillan wrote in his diary that to rebuild it was now his most urgent and delicate task. So what a fine old mess we're in now. Um, now, this is a really interesting episode because it shows just how frayed the relationship gets prior to Thatcher, basically. I, I think from the Suez crisis, 56, until pretty much 79, this is a really rocky period for, for UK-American relations. And um, in fact, I basically support some of the policies that we'll see. And I think that they were right to try to pursue them, to try to get out from under the eagle's wing. I think it was the right thing to do. It's what I would have done if I was a prime minister. And I, I think that the basic strategy since Thatcher to essentially bend over, which is what um, Britain has done since... 1979 has been a mistake, essentially. So, anyway, let's uh, let's carry on. It never seemed so prosperous or so secure. But within months of his inauguration, confidence was shaken by unexpected and unwelcome news. This is Radio Moscow. As a result of intensive work by research institutes and designing bureaus, the first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. This first satellite was today successfully launched in the USSR. At the present time, the satellite is... So let's skip on uh, from this uh, this little bit here, because I'm uh, going to get to... This stuff is less interesting, I think. Let's get on to some of the meteor things. Uh, um, let's get to... Um, maybe around there, yeah, maybe around here. Coming to land on an airfield in England, and they're home again. To the United States Third Air Force, England has always been home. They were formed here in 1948, and the force has had its headquarters in Britain ever since. <laughs> We referred to East Anglia as the 49th state, mainly because there were so many Yanks there. And primarily the Yanks had been there before in World War II. There were brand new Yanks coming. We were taking over flight operations from the RAF. There were so many of them there and so many English people who had been related to girls who married GIs that you could go into a pub and have ice in your drink, which you couldn't get anywhere else in England at the time. And uh, it got to a point was it was a suburb of New York or Chicago or wherever you came from because there would be somebody in the town close to you were station had been there or had a daughter marry a Yankee and went back there. From the late 1950s, Britain's nuclear links with America grew stronger year by year. Britain's own nuclear deterrent was carried by her elegant but outdated V-bomber force. Macmillan needed a new delivery system if he was to stay in the big league. Uh, Macmillan really reminds me of like a Monty Python character or something. He reminds me of like the, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, when Graham uh, Chapman plays uh, the general, you know, stop that, it's silly. Uh, Macmillan is basically a character like that. Um, kind of uh, like watching footage of him. <laughs> It was clear that there are free-falling bombs from the V-bomber force were nearing the end of their life. I mean, they could probably go on another five or six years or eight years, but you couldn't get hope to get through the Russian defences after that time. So we had to get a standoff weapon. We were very attracted by Skybolt, which the United States Air Force wanted themselves. 
and wanted us to have as well. Skybolt was not yet in production, but Eisenhower agreed to sell it to Macmillan in return for Britain accommodating one more American weapon system. What Eisenhower wanted was a safe harbor in Western Europe to service the most sophisticated weapon yet devised, the submarine-launched Polaris missile. Macmillan offered Holylock in Scotland as a base. The decision had been kept secret, and the arrival of the Polaris fleet caused some alarm. Their primary concern was, were radiation levels. They wanted to be reassured that there wasn't going to be any nuclear accident. They were much more concerned about that than they were about, about uh, the weapon system itself. They just didn't want any leaks. And of course, I could reassure them that I had four children in the Holy Lock, as did most of the families. So I'm going to skip on a little bit because this uh, stuff about Polaris is uh, possibly... Let's get on to a bit of Khrushchev action here. And uh, JFK is around the corner as well. Let's get to the the Rusky involvement. Hold on. But we had great faith in these Ministry of Trade or Border Trade life jackets. From the minority of anti-nuclear objectors, the proposal to base Proteus in Holy Lock was unpopular. Macmillan was determined to have nuclear weapons because he didn't believe Britain could remain a great power without them. With them, her Prime Minister would be a world statesman. In 1959, he visited Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, in an effort to thaw the Cold War and to arrange an East-West summit meeting. But a dramatic incident was to destroy the summit almost before it had begun. An American U-2 spy plane was shot down flying over Russian territory. The wreckage was put on display in Moscow. When Eisenhower refused to apologize for the incident, Khrushchev broke off the summit, and Britain's attempt to keep a place for herself at the top table had failed. I've never seen uh, Harold Macmillan so depressed as he was uh, on the latter part of that meeting, because his whole object had been to try and act as, 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 as the uh, um, bringer together of these two powers. And um, he found that he hadn't got the, the strength, Britain on its own, hadn't got the strength to force either side to come together. He was trying, though, bless him. He was trying to... See, this is... I, I, watching this, I kind of respected these middle prime ministers here uh mcmillan and then heath um and a little bit wilson as well for basically trying to position britain in a way that it still had some sort of relevance and it still had some self-respect and so on and um I, I really do feel that uh it was thatcher and blair really who threw that threw any semblance of being separate from america away um so I kind of I kind of respect what they're I mean, obviously they've not been dealt great cards here and they're trying to do the best with the situation they've got, but I kinda I kinda respect it. Uh, it was the last time Britain would attend a superpower summit. As Eisenhower prepared to retire, Macmillan wrote sadly to his old friend, I'll try my best to keep our governments and our two countries on the same course, but I can never hope to have anything to replace the sort of relations we have had. In the greatest story of a momentous year, John F. Kennedy defeated GOP standard bearer Richard Nixon in one of the closest presidential elections on record. Fortified, as we know. That's a cigar stream I did with Charlie back in the day where we looked into that election. Um, there, was, there was definite cheating by JFK in that one. The youngest man ever elected president takes the burden from the oldest ever to hold the office as America enters the critical and challenging 60s. Kennedy's election brought an era to an end. As he himself reminded America, a younger, more vigorous administration was now in charge. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed 
to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Tucker Carlson loving this. Tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace. Kennedy brought a new breed into government, intellectuals from the universities and business who were to re-examine American policy and the principles behind it. It seemed to Macmillan that any cosy assumptions about the relationship between Britain and America might now be in jeopardy. I saw Harold Macmillan, uh, who was then Prime Minister, shortly after Kennedy had been elected president. And uh, he had heard that uh, I was a friend of Kennedy's and he wanted to know more about the man. He said to me, you know, I've had such a very in Algiers during the war. We belong to the same generation. We had a similar outlook on the world. And now there is this young, cocky Irishman in the White House. How am I going to establish this kind of special relationship with him? Macmillan needn't have feared. The new president, over 20 years his junior, responded warmly to the elder statesman, one of the few world leaders to whom he could talk without interpreters. Kennedy admired his patrician manner. He took Macmillan into his confidence and was soon referring to him as Uncle Harold. So you've got to get, Macmillan is doing his best. He really is. He's doing his best. Got to respect that. In less than four years, Fidel Castro, who came to power on a wave of personal popularity, has allowed... In October 1962, Kennedy faced the most frightening crisis of his presidency. Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, had allowed Russia to start building a missile site in Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. Kennedy's announcement that America was blockading Cuba to prevent any more Russian ships getting through brought Russia and America to the brink of war. Each night of the crisis, Kennedy spoke by telephone to Macmillan. President Kennedy faced a problem of credibility on the first day of the missile crisis. And it was the British who advised him to make public the air photographs of the missile sites in Cuba. And President Kennedy did so over the objections of a number of people in our intelligence community. Well, as soon as he released those photographs of the missile sites, the credibility problem simply disappeared. When Russia backed down, Macmillan claimed Britain had not been inactive during the trial of strength. But according to Kennedy's officials, it was only a supporting role. I think the real solution came in direct contacts between President Kennedy and Mr. Khrushchev. I don't believe that Britain played the role of an, in, of an intermediary or anything of that sort. But fortunately, uh, Mr. Khrushchev decided to uh, withdraw the missiles. At the White House, there was jubilation over the way the crisis had been resolved. But whatever part Britain had played, it failed to avert a gathering storm over the relationship. Robert McNamara, the new defense secretary, was undertaking a review of all American defense spending. This character, McNamara, by the way, I watched uh, like a 10 part documentary series once on Vietnam. Uh, it was kind of a recent one, it was kind of a big deal when it came out. I forgot what it's called now. And uh, McNamara doesn't come across particularly well in that documentary. Um, he's kind of like the villain of the piece. Uh, I kind of, um, even though he was presented that way, I kind of admired his cold calculating and spreadsheet approach to <laughs> to his task. But um, yeah, he's got a uh, mixed reputation, let's just say. Among the weapons he wanted to cancel was Skyboat, the nuclear missile which Eisenhower had promised to Macmillan. Skybolt, according to McNamara, was too expensive and behind schedule. When the news broke in London, there was consternation. My understanding was that Bob McNamara had explained to his British colleagues that 
Skyboat was in deep, deep trouble. But apparently the, uh, the cabinet and the parliament were not prepared for the possibility of a cancellation of Skyboat. And if I may say with a smile, I, I think it's possible that the surprise in London was somewhat exaggerated as part of the bargaining position in order to get further nuclear cooperation from the United States. Dean Rusk may have thought the British government was exaggerating, but in London they felt they had plenty to worry about. And they were particularly upset by a famous speech that was made here at the West Point Military Academy in December 1962 by the revered elder statesman, the former Secretary of State, Dean Acheson. He said of Britain, Great Britain has lost an empire and has not yet found a role. And he went on to say, the attempt to play a role apart from Europe, a role based on a special relationship with the United States, is about played out. In trying to act as a broker between Russia and the United States, Britain was conducting a policy as weak as its military power. In other words, this famous American was telling the British government, look, you're no longer a great power. You should stop posturing as though you were one. You should stop trading on a special relationship with the United States. You should go and join Europe, which is where you really belong. Acheson's wild words have caused an international furore. <laughs> oh, but, but this Acheson thing, Jack. It's Harold here. <laughs> Uh, Harold Macmillan. <laughs> M-A-C-R. <laughs> uh, I'm calling from London. Now, now look here. This thing doesn't rep <laughs> not, not, Not the worst impression in the world. ...represent the views of your government, does it? Oh. <laughs> well, goodbye, then. I mean, I, I kind of agree with... Uh, I kind of... Even though... It was kind of uh, a, a slap in the face of what Macmillan was trying to do. Um, I do kind of agree with uh, the assessment of the American uh, Atchison there. Basically correct. Should need it to kind of go its own way a little bit more, um, which was easy for him to say, I, I suppose, because obviously this is not that long ago that Britain had been absolutely slapped down by the Americans over Suez. Um, Macmillan is trying his best to find some sort of relevance here, though. Um, unfortunately, he's kind of a bit of a spare wheel. Um, anyway, let's carry on. Just before Christmas, a worried Macmillan arrived in the Bahamas for a summit with Kennedy. Atchison's words were still ringing in his ears, and he knew he'd have a fight to get his way. Macmillan still believed that an American-supplied nuclear weapon system was the only way of guaranteeing Britain's status as a great power. And he had decided on the weapon he wanted. We met in Nassau in that millionaire's compound. It was quite extraordinary. And the first evening there was this barbecue on the beach and everybody was drinking rum punches and so on. And along came Macmillan dressed you know, for number 10. And I thought it was you know, slightly ridiculous the evening on the beach in the West Indies. And he was, you know, jovial and jolly, and eventually I sort of led him aside and said, no, what do you want, Prime Minister? And he just said, Polaris. The whole world is making a fuss about a sky boat you came up to discuss, but you can be sure definitely... I mean, basically, he wants nukes. And I think it's basically the right... You know... He was right to to make Britain more relevant. It needed to be need it needed these things that Macmillan was after. So I I basically agree with his policies here. Um, I'm less hard on these middle prime ministers than I am on Churchill because you know what could they do? All those decisions had already been made. You know, so we have the maximum security. We don't mind Russia saying this or that. Three cheers for stars and strikes and the Union Jack. Yes, I said welcome, welcome. Macmillan and Kennedy, welcome, welcome. Your visit to Nassau will go down in history. Kennedy arrived at Macmillan's headquarters with a conflict to resolve. He was aware that Macmillan needed a replacement for Skyboat for political reasons. Without it, his policy of depending on America would be made to look very foolish. But a powerful faction in the State Department, 
wanted Kennedy to end Britain's nuclear pretensions once and for all. Her proper place, they thought, was as a medium-sized power in Europe with America alone providing the West nuclear cover. Oh, thanks. <laughs> the spokesman of this group was George Ball, a senior State Department official. I was, I was very determined to have the British begin to get out of the feeling that, uh, you know, they were a great power. Well, fuck you, George Ball. I'm with Macmillan on this. Go on because they had an empire which they no longer had uh, and that they had a nuclear weapon which the others didn't have and, and uh, they had a relationship with the United States which nobody else had. This seemed to be not very healthy even from the British point of view. Harold Macmillan made this very, very moving um, statement. It wasn't exactly an appeal, but it was a statement of the um, historical position of this country and the proud uh, the way in which we'd fought in two wars and, uh, how we were much smaller, but much less important, perhaps, in world terms, but still uh, had a sense of our own uh, importance in the world, our own fitness, and our own desire to play a proper part in the alliance, and uh, as, as, as allies, and also as, as independent country. And, uh, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, including mine. I mean, it was very, very moving. Kennedy, I think, was very moved that his senior in jeopardy as a result of a United States decision. There was a feeling that Kennedy had that the British deserved to be a part of the, of the nuclear club. And uh, just uh, practical political terms, he was... See, he did what it took. He did what it took. I have no problem with these actions by Macmillan. Gotta do what you gotta do. I wasn't going to do this to an old friend who, uh, whom he admired. And why were you willing to do it to an old friend who you admired? Well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared to, to destroy the British deterrent. I was just not prepared to, or not anxious, to see it extended for a whole new generation because I could see a lot of complications. At Nassau, Kennedy sided with Macmillan. Britain became the only country, apart from the United States, to own the new powerful weapons system. The lesson of this special treatment was not lost on her neighbour across the Channel. Major achievement for Macmillan at that. Major achievement. I mean, okay, he had to uh, swallow a bit of pride and beg about and make a few speeches and whatnot, but he got his way. Good, good politics. A staggering blow is dealt to Western unity in this council hall in Brussels when France blackballs Britain from the common market. The goal's veto on Britain joining Europe confirmed the State Department's worst fears. The Nassau Agreement had played straight into his hands. He was able to use it as further evidence that Britain didn't seriously intend to become a European nation. It was just what Winston Churchill had said to de Gaulle. And even better, you made the French upset. Fucking brilliant. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm... I have a good assessment of this, uh, these actions by Macmillan. <laughs> ...during the war about Britain. Each time we're forced to choose between Europe and the open sea, we shall always choose the open sea. And so the State Department's grand design for a united Europe was frustrated once again by the one factor they could never control, the ties of sentiment and of history that bound Britain and America. <laughs> He played a blinder, old Harold did. He played a blinder here. This is a sad time for all people. We have... So the, the fact is, right, even though he had to, to kind of bed, uh, suck up the Americans and stuff to get it, the fact that Macmillan managed to make Britain a uh, nuclear power won it more power and greater independence for itself over this next period, as you'll see. It's absolutely vital that it did that. Suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. The election of Lyndon Johnson as president in 1964 oh. showed...
Boo, worst president ever. ...that personality can affect political relationships. No ties of sentiment or experience made the former Texan senator particularly interested in Britain, and he had little in common with the new occupant of Downing Street, Britain's first socialist prime minister in a decade, Harold Wilson. Things are about to take a very bad turn in UK-US relations after, I would say, the Macmillan-JFK relationship was probably the high point after the war. Um, things were about to take a very bad turn. Johnson-Wilson years saw growing misunderstanding and distrust between Britain and America. Based by... The strongest influence of the era was not politicians, but a new breed of standard bearer. I have, to have to be careful with copyright because <laughs> Beatles are the most copyrighted people in the entire world, so we have to be careful here. New Yorkers turned out in force and making allowance for an American accent, the screams might have been genuine Merseyside. George, John, Paul, and Ringo had found a new world to conquer. So I've always been interested in the. Um, the British invasion and how it was used basically to try to cement this idea that we have a shared destiny and all this sort of stuff kind of in, kind of it interests me as a want to know the power behind it something I wanted to potentially have a chapter on the Boomer Truth regime but I've never quite got to the bottom of it all The Beatles seduced the people of America into a 60s love affair with Britain, conducted with a gaiety that made... So, like, was that, like, an MI6 operation or what? Um, it just seems so... Why did that happen? The British invasion and Beatlemania in America and the love affair and all this bullshit. Because it just seems very convenient. That's all I'm saying, but anyway. ...made much more impact than the grey world of politics. Johnson's welcome to Wilson at the White House was less effusive. Britain was back with her begging bow. Wilson's election had been followed by a run on sterling and he needed a four billion dollar loan to shore up the economy. The loan was agreed but with strings attached. The government would have to cut its spending plans and some of Britain's more lavish projects were in jeopardy. The American defense establishment had some suggestions to offer. In 1965 the Americans were marketing a new fighter bomber, the F-111. For six years Britain had been developing a similar plane the TSR-2. The F-111 was now offered to Britain at half the price of her own plane, a deal which critics say began as an American attempt to kill off Concorde. The Americans said to them, look here, yes, we let you have the money, but we don't see why we should subsidize a prestige projects like the Concorde. And of course, by this time, they were much more worried about the Concorde as it was going ahead, and they would have nothing comparable. Anyway, we couldn't untie the I didn't want to, but the Labour government wanted to, passionately, but they couldn't untie the treaty. So they went back to Washington and said so. And it's at that point, as far as I understand it, the Americans said, well, what else could you cancel? You've got this very expensive TSR-2, which is much the same as our F-111. Why don't you cancel the TSR-2 and we let you have the F-111 fairly cheap? Britain cancelled TSR-2 in 1965. The prototypes were destroyed and an option taken to buy the American F-111. The government was accused of scrapping the project under pressure from the United States. The thousands of workers who lost their jobs believed the TSR-2 was better than its American alternative and that Britain had... Undoubtedly correct. Undoubtedly correct they were as well. ...missed an opportunity. The Labour government argued that the plane had already cost too much and that Britain must learn to be more modest. 
So in your view, no harm in buying American if it's the cheapest and best thing around? There's obviously a risk if you become dependent on a single source uh, for a major element in defense spending. But it's become obvious that a medium-sized country like Britain cannot produce everything it wants for itself the whole time. I, th I think generally the, w the Wilson government wasn't, wasn't very good as a whole, domestic or foreign, to be honest. But. The Germans buy most of their stuff abroad. It hasn't damaged them economically. It hasn't damaged them in terms of civil R&D. And... Uh, it's probably given them more efficient forces than they'd have had if they tried to produce everything for themselves. Vietnam, America's unwinnable war. Begun by Kennedy, fought with increasing ferocity by Johnson, abandoned by Nixon. The British government never supported this attempt to defend South Vietnam against a communist takeover from the North, however eloquently the case was put. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can perceive. Pretty much the only thing that Britain sat out since World War II was Vietnam. They never got involved in this one. Now will we bluster, or bully, or flaunt our power? But we will not surrender. And we will not retreat. Johnson was angry and disappointed by Wilson's reaction to the war. Wilson's support was lukewarm, often accompanied by attempts to arbitrate, and by private criticism of the way it was being fought, particularly of the big bombing raids. I won't tell you how to run Malaysia, Johnson exploded, and you don't tell me how to run Vietnam. In World War II, the United States went to uh, Britain when she was in her darkest hour. We backed her up, so why couldn't she back us up now? I don't feel that Britain is letting us down for feeling this way, but I don't think they should give up supporting us because they are our ally and they are to help us. If Britain had sent a significant contingent of forces to Vietnam. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, fuck us over in Suez now, uh, help us out with Vietnam. Come on. It could have made a very important difference, particularly on the political side of things. The American people have taken some 600,000 casualties and dead and wounded since the end of World War II in support of collective security. And the effort has not been very collective. Um... We put up 90% of the non-Korean forces in Korea, 80% of the non-Vietnamese forces. Yeah, an American war. In Vietnam. An American war. I mean, what, I mean, what, oh yeah, we put up most of the forces for our own wars. I mean, what, what sort of fucking argument is this? And this sense among the American people that we've been asked to do too much relatively alone is a very important consideration. And so had there been more flags flying in Vietnam, it could have made a... A substantial difference. As the unending procession of the dead came home, with no victories to their names, many Americans began to doubt the wisdom of the course Johnson had set. The president, anxious to demonstrate that this was not an all-American folly, urged friendly allies to join the campaign in the interests of the free world. We came under very heavy pressure. I remember Abel Harriman coming over once as special representative and saying, uh, we must join the fight for democracy. I said, but what sort of democracy are we defending in South Vietnam? And I said, look, uh, we think you've made a great mistake, but you're friends of ours. Uh, we're not going to rub it in in public, but don't ask us. Uh. Can you imagine the British government being that independently minded now, even in the shit show of the 60s? And, you know, it's, the Wilson government wasn't good and Healy was not a particularly great defence minister. But they were still independent-minded enough just to say, no, jog jog on, LBJ, fuck off. Good. Good on him. Good on them. To say that we think you're fighting for a freedom and justice and so on, we don't. We hope you'll get out of it as fast as you can. I went to this party on the seventh floor of the State Department, and it was a very good party, lots to drink. And Dean Russ a drinking man, a bourbon water. Bourbon and Branch, he called it. And uh, it, the party went on for a long time, and he came over to me, 
And he looked down at me, he was a tall man, and he was perspiring. And he said, why didn't you send troops to Vietnam, Louis? And I said, Mr. Secretary, you know why. I mean, we've, we've been over this before. And then he got very angry, and he said, why didn't you send just one battalion of the Black Watch? That would have been enough for us. Just one battalion of the Black Watch. And he paused and glowered at me and said, when the Russians invade Sussex, don't expect us to come and help you. Fuming. Absolutely fuming they were. Good. Britain was now giving up the last of her responsibilities around the globe. America, preoccupied in Vietnam, was uneasy about it. The United States had always urged Britain to disband the empire, but wondered whether her disappearance at this moment was wise. I think as Britain began to withdraw from various parts of the empire, and you could see the flags coming down from New Delhi and Karachi and Nassau uh, and Mauritius and all of these other areas of the world, it left the United States with a little bit of lonely feeling that, uh, that uh, our closest international partner... Jog on, Ronald. Jog on. Fuck them. Uh, ...was withdrawing from areas that we knew very little about, in which we didn't have a presence. Jog on, Ronald McDonald. And I think it was a cause for concern and anxiety in the United States. The United States had become accustomed to Britain sharing the role of international policemen, and her retirement was bound to leave a gap. Under the pressure of a worsening financial crisis, the Labour government cancelled its order for new aircraft carriers. It then announced that most of its overseas troops in the Middle and the Far East, from the Persian Gulf to Singapore, were to be withdrawn. The Prime Minister flew to Washington to break the news to the President. Harold Wilson often stays at Blair House, which is only proper when he visits Washington. This time, the British Prime Minister is staying here at the British Embassy. Protocol experts insist no slight was intended. But it's an open secret here that Harold Wilson is not one of the administration's favorite people at this time. Wilson arrived here last night, accompanied by his wife and top diplomatic and financial experts. Wilson was urged, almost begged by the administration, not to cut British forces in the Far East, but he did just that. Britain's withdrawal came at a dis- Can I get a, can I get a Wikipedia check on Marvin Cull, please? I feel like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I just got a funny feeling about that one. Uh, all right, let's carry on. Disastrous moment for Johnson. With the Viet Cong gaining ground, he had no troops to spare to protect other Western interests. But the Wilson government was committed to what the London Times called its wholesale slaughter of sacred cows and was not to be dissuaded. At a White House reception, Wilson was treated to a baritone singing a famous tribute to Britain's imperial greatness. Some saw it as a wry reminder from the president of what Britain had once been. Oh, did, I mean, honestly, the Americans can, at this point, after, after everything we've seen, you know, up to this point, just fuck it, you're not going to get help now. But unfortunately, as we'll see, all of this is undone by Thatcher. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. But I actually kind of support the general direction that, uh, that Wilson and co are taking here, vis-a-vis -vis specifically what they're up to uh, in the foreign policy. Um, you know, what other choices do they have at this point? Um, you know, now after all the humiliations and stuff, you want Britain to commit like, you know, men and troops and, uh, resources to, you know, help you run the world. Fuck it. No, I, I can't, I basically agree with the actions of the British government here, um, as well. LBJ was a twat. He really was. Hey, aren't you here?
the dawn comes up like thunder and of China grows the ah, Camel Riders, look at that, Camel Riders. The United States hadn't suddenly developed a love of the British Empire on its deathbed, but it believed Britain should have tried harder to maintain her influence in the more volatile parts of the world. Certainly... Just, just, just jog on, Ronald, like I said. It was true at one time that the Americans seemed to be critical of the British because we had a large empire, and I think they sometimes felt that in the war we were more concerned about preserving our empire uh, then about the defeat of, of Nazi tyranny. Um, in the years after the war, they came to see that the sudden shrinking of Britain's imperial power was going to create problems in the world which would be problems for them have to solve. The pink patches on the globe, the British Empire on which the sun never set, were vanishing fast. A dangerous vacuum was left in the Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf, where the Soviet Union was on the prowl and the United States had no bases. One British colony, instead of winning its independence, was virtually handed over to the United States, the arch anti-colonialist. Diego Garcia was a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. Unfortunately for its inhabitants, this tropical paradise was ideally placed to serve as a giant military base. In a secret agreement, Britain forcibly removed its thousand residents and handed the island to the United States. In return, America lent the British 14 million pounds to help pay for the Polaris missile system. If one had not had access to Diego Garcia, there is no good substitute. What one would have had to do was to uh, seek bases on the Rimlands with all of the consequences that that has for uh, having bases in populated areas and being forced out. What a wonderful thing it would have been had we been able to retain vestige. There have been some epic eyebrows doing this particular <laughs> episode, as they're not amazing eyebrows these old men have. This of the British Empire in that area. When, when, when do you get old enough to get epic eyebrows like that? I want eyebrows like that. And without it, we have had to create the American equivalent, uh, a huge uh, facility on a barren atoll. Did you feel it was uh, right in the course of this to give one bit of territory to the Americans, the Diego Garcia base? Was that a, 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 that seems almost like a transfer of a bit of empire. Well, it was in a way, I suppose, and I think in, in fact it was probably an error. But at that particular time, they started uh, building facilities on Diego Garcia at the time when we had facilities like that at Gan in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And, uh, but I think looking back on it, we uh, made a mistake in doing so at the cost of transferring a lot of islanders against their will. And, uh, but I suppose it was a thing that was difficult to den deny them when it cost us so little and we were doing so many things they didn't like in other parts of the third world. I'm, wor I'm worried about copyright, so I'm just going to stop it a little bit. Uh... As Britain shrugged off the responsibilities of empire, she seemed to gain a new vitality. The capital was now swinging London. Wood, wood. Its energies channeled into frivolity. Five years ago it was Rome, and now it's London. Chelsea is very gay. Yes. I think it's great for them. I think it's the image of the miniskirts and the, and the, the pretty... Carnaby Street and things like that. I think that's what makes London swingy. The attitudes of the young, even the extravagance of their dress, was adapted from America's West Coast hippie culture. Critics said Britain was sinking, giggling into the sea. Britain was sinking, giggling into the sea. What an amazing quote. Was that Mick Jagger singing with her? What's this? What's this like Beatles Stones get together? Interesting. 
The idea that faith should be put in love and individual freedom was nurtured by the war in Vietnam. This is truly boomer truth. Truly boomer truth right here. A disaffected generation in America found it had growing support in Britain. The two governments might be at odds, but the young were... The chi was not a word. ...united. On October... Oh, terrible physiognomy on those hippies just now. Terrible. They were much better looking in Carnaby Street than they were in that crowd. Over the 27th, 1968, 70,000 demonstrators swirled through the streets of London. It was one of the biggest protests the city had ever seen. I think the predominant view amongst young people uh, in schools, which were very active in those days, polytechnics and campuses, were that they were the evil empire. That was the image of the United States then. The demonstrations in Britain against the war. I mean, basically correct. There's this correct view that uh, America is the evil empire. <laughs> the basically correct view of America. Shocked the United States more than France or Germany or any of these other countries because Britain had for a long time been regarded as the most loyal ally of the United States in Europe. <coughs> For many in Britain, the power of the United States no longer seemed benign. Instead, they saw a country engaged in an angry, futile attempt to impose its authority on a lesser power, and apparently destroying itself in the process. For those with memories of the close bonds forged in World War II, the sight of young Britons attacking the American embassy was shameful. It, was, it wasn't just the ordinary demonstration, obviously. Uh, there was more passion really involved, more hostility and more frustration. And uh, that doesn't make for a very pleasant scene. I'd have been there. I'd, I reckon if I was around, I'd, I'd have been there as well. Fuck the American embassy. You, you weren't scared by it. You were, you were saddened by it. You felt, as we all did, this feeling of kinship to the UK to see this demonstration of anti-American feeling. It, it left a bad taste and it, it saddened me. Look <laughs> at that bit in the flag, fucking hell. Oh, shit. Uh, they were burning the flag there. Let's have a, let's have a look. Uh... You, you weren't scared by it. You were, you were saddened by it. We felt, as we all did, this feeling of kinship to the UK to see this demonstration of anti-American feeling. It left a bad taste, and it, it saddened me, really. The violent demonstrations here outside the American embassy were mainly the work of the young, but they were by no means the only people in Britain concerned about America's presence in Vietnam. One great thing they did have in the 60s is that organ. I, I'm, I'm very into the various different organs that use, the Hammonds and the various other ones, as I've talked about on other shows, very into the organ as an instrument, me. But let's, let's carry on. Britain's socialist government, though it never formally opposed America's presence, was nevertheless worried about her use of power and sought to modify it. But she was impotent to wield any influence. The two countries' roles were diverging. Britain, with her empire mainly gone, was giving up her overseas responsibilities. The United States, so long cautious about using power beyond her shores, was now striding the world stage with a new confidence, vividly demonstrated by the next president. Richard Nixon was determined to pull America out of the morass of Vietnam. Taking over from Johnson, he escalated the war, but maneuvered for peace. In 1972, he met Mao Zedong in communist China and enlisted his help in reaching a solution. He visited Brezhnev in Russia and ensured his acquiescence too. 
the war which had alienated America from its allies was ended. Britain, meanwhile, finally achieved what the United States had urged on her for so long. The new Conservative Prime Minister, Edward Heath, took her into Europe as a full member of the economic community. But Britain didn't act quite as America had hoped. Instead of being a loyal ally, America's voice in Europe, Heath wanted Britain to adopt a new approach. The way Heath conceived it, it was intended as a revolution in Britain's post-war foreign policy, in the sense... This is good. This was basically a correct strategy from Heath. Correct strategy. That he wanted to lay down the special relationship with the United States and emphasize Britain's role as a European country and indeed as a leader of Europe. Yes. It didn't quite work that way. But I believe it has left Britain sort of suspended between the Heath conception and the old conception. And it neither became a leader of Europe, nor did it remain, retain the intimate ties with the United States. It still has very good ties with the United States. Heath believed Britain had no future tagging along behind America, that she could never wield any influence on a world of superpowers except through Europe. America had to come to terms with the new arrangement. In October 1973, Heath's views were vividly illustrated. On the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, Egypt and Syria mounted a joint attack on Israel to avenge their defeat six years before. Russia supplied the Arabs, America the Israelis. Europe was threatened by the Arabs with the loss of oil supply. It allowed their bases to be used by the Americans. Britain took part in what Kissinger called a stampede of disassociation. Why did you decide not to allow British bases to be used? Because in the Yom Kippur War... Based. We took the position, the whole cabinet, the whole government, we were supported by parliament, that we would be even-handed between the Arab world and Israel. Based. We had been supplying goods to both, and when the Yom Kippur War broke out, we stopped supplying to both. And if we had uh, accepted the... Can you imagine a prime minister today being as independently minded as this? This is my this is my whole point. I mean, he's at least, you know, he's setting out a principal position and going it his own way, as opposed to, you know, just following whatever America does and uh, saluting the Israeli flag. I mean, this is good. Quest, then we would obviously have not any longer been equal-handed. Uh, we would have been leaning more to one side than the other, and that was not in British interests. The fiercest fighting was here in the southern sector of the Suez Canal. I'm on the west bank now, where the Israelis have been clearing all before them and cutting off the Egyptian Third Army. A dramatic Israeli victory was in sight. The Egyptian Third Army was paralyzed and the road to Cairo open. The war was in danger of getting out of control, with Russia under pressure to save its allies. Washington was in the grip of its own crisis, the Watergate scandal was coming to a head, with President Nixon removing some of his closest advisers. At this moment, the Soviet Union warned Washington that it intended to send its own Russian troops to defend Egypt. Uh, we reacted to a Brezhnev no note, and you must recall that that was the very week that the first calls for Mr. Nixon's impeachment came about, and the week of the firings. And as a consequence, we were fearful that the Soviet Union thought that the United States was so preoccupied with her domestic difficulties that it could not react to the Middle Eastern crisis and was prepared, therefore, to make a bold move that would have brought Soviet forces into Egypt and elsewhere into the Middle East. We had to react forcefully and we had to react quickly because the, we knew that Soviet aircraft were standing down in Eastern Europe. Uh, we had a meeting of the National Security Council as a consequence, and we decided to put the forces throughout most of the world on the alert. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what's your understanding as to why there has been a military alert? Right. Well, the, there is only a precautionary alert, but the overwhelming emphasis is on diplomacy at this time. 
Well, why is there an alert at all? Well, uh, there's an alert because there is a serious situation in the Mideast, right. but it's precautionary. Well, a serious the situation meaning what? Well, meaning that there, there, there have been ceasefire violations. That's all. Con yeah, Congressman, that's all. one other that's question. All. Is this an effort to warn the Soviets? Not that I know of, no. The warning to Russia was clear. If they didn't back down, they risked massive American retaliation. The nuclear alert applied to all American bases in Britain, where America was thought to be under an obligation to consult the British government. All leave was cancelled, battle kits were worn, jets were armed, supplies were flown in around the clock. But Britain was told nothing until the decision had been implemented. We could not consult the Allies because we thought we were under the impression that the Soviets were going to intervene that night. And uh, after all, since the Europeans had dissociated themselves from us to begin with all through the crisis, but practically there was no other choice. But it goes to the heart of things. The refusal by Britain to let you use the bases, followed by the nuclear alert without consulting Britain, and you make it sound like a sort of tit-for-tat. No, it wasn't a tit-for-tat. That particular, uh, what happened was that we got a message from Brezhnev which we read as saying that he proposed joint intervention by the United States and the Soviet Union, and if we refused, the Soviet Union would intervene unilaterally. I do recall that we all thought that the situation didn't demand a nuclear alert. We had to act in the light of the best judgment that we could make of what the common interest of the, what the common interest was. Uh, so when you this, I think, is fascinating. Probably the most interesting part of the whole documentary, uh, it, you know, certainly of this episode. This, this, this whole uh, kind of forgotten little episode here. So when one asks, was Britain put unnecessarily at risk? One ha has to define the word unnecessarily. Did we have a choice about it? In an ideal world, if we had had three days, we should have had consultation with Britain, and Britain should have had consultation with Europe. And we would never have convinced the Soviets that we were serious. Is it actually practical in the modern age with those weapons and the threat of thermonuclear war to have joint decision making on yes. the use of bases? Yes, no doubt about that at all. Is the time based? Yes. Based. <laughs> based. <laughs> based. How can that be when split second reactions are needed? Well, because nobody can visualize a situation in which there isn't uh, some form of build-up. And nobody can visualize a situation in which our intelligence, with all the modern devices of satellites, doesn't warn us of any possibility of a build-up. This again is mythology. Twelve hours after the alert, the Soviets backed down. American troops stood easy. But in Washington, there was mounting fury at the way that Europe had behaved. By ignoring America's plea to put her case to the other European allies, Britain, it was said, had demonstrated where her true loyalties now lay. President Nixon was driven to issue a warning. I do not mean to leave this question with the impression that the European and American alliance is shattered. It is not. I do indicate, however, that it is a time when the Europeans, as well as we, must sit down and determine that we are either going to go along together on both the security and the economic and political fronts, or we will go separately. Britain and America now had important decisions to make. The United States had more than 300,000... See, to me it's fascinating that at this moment there could have been a different reality. Unfortunately, Thatcher is around the corner. And I, I, I believe that is what changes everything. Troops stationed in Europe. After what was seen as the Allied betrayal in the Yom Kippur War, there was growing pressure in the United States to bring the boys home and let Europe defend itself. Kissinger commented, America... That would have been amazing. That is exactly what should have happened. If, if only that could have happened at that point, it would have been amazing. America and its democratic allies are drifting not only apart, but into a competition. For Britain, there was a stark choice. She'd now experienced the difficulties of distancing herself from the United States and the resentment that it caused. Should she still try to make her own way in a united Europe? Or should... 
Yes. Could she revert to her old sanctuary no. under the eagle's wing? No. Unfortunately, as we'll see next time, that is exactly what Thatcher ended up doing. Uh, anyway, this is uh, a fascinating documentary, really fascinating. Um, o An Ocean Apart does not have a big reputation um, in the Adam Curtis canon. Uh, it's one of his lesser known documentaries, but I think it's been absolutely phenomenal, to be honest. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, let's have a look at a few super chats that people have left here. Glow in the Dark says, the funny thing is, I said years ago that Britain destroyed the empire and America benefited from it, taking their spot as number one. I didn't even know the whole story. I just read about it and extrapolated it out. He also says, Churchill, number one American advocate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Churchill, just, uh, you know, honestly, the most pathetic figure. And we have seen we saw a number of subsequent prime ministers. And I would say that um, Eden, Macmillan, Wilson, Heath, all come out as better than Churchill in this documentary. Uh, and Clement Attlee, and Clement Attlee as well. They all come out better than, than Churchill, in my opinion. Um, you know, I can understand their actions, whereas Churchill's actions are the actions of a weak and pathetic traitor, basically. Um, I will continue. The Holocon record says, I was a bit skeptical about this series, but I am enjoying them greatly. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot, Holocron Records. It means so much. Glow in the Dark says, Britain's empire lives vicariously through America. Um, well, I mean, at some points that may have been true, but perhaps less so. Uh, Tricolis, the last Celt, says, AA could choose from a wealth of proud Iranian names. Kaved, Khosro, Baram, all proud names for a possible son. Instead, he'd name him John. Um, I, that's not necessarily the case. I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, but uh, AAA does not have an Iranian name. Uh, she has an English name. Uh, Baliel Bradley says, it would be interesting had Nixon won in 1960 and contended with the deep state earlier when it wasn't as entrenched, JFK was a deep. Um, yeah, it would have, yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, though, that uh, JFK's youth and possible naivety played into Macmillan's, played to Macmillan's advantage, as we saw. Um, you know, it actually showed some of the drawbacks of having a, a young and slightly naive chap in the White House, I think, uh, because, you know, he was able to wrap JFK around his finger, really, wasn't he? Um, so there we go. All right, that's it for the Super Chats, as far as I can see. Hope you're enjoying this series, friends. Um, do buy my courses at the Academic Agency. But most importantly of all, ladies and gentlemen, get out. What goes on in this town is none of your business. As long as I'm living here, it is. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here! Well, that's easily fixed.